Kia ora, I'm Alexia Russell and welcome to the Details Long Read. This week a story from music and culture writer Tony Stamp, published in David Farrier's newsletter Webworm. It's from his column Totally Normal and it's called Is Film Criticism a Blessing or a Curse? It's Tony talking about one of his favourite things, film criticism, and how the art of criticising is being threatened by a new wave of young social media savvy disruptors. Tony's here with us to read his um, mildly censored column (laughs) himself, and then we're going to get critical. Kia ora, Tony, award-winning music critic. Kia ora, Alexia. Look, take us away. Recently, I logged on to the internet and became consumed with rage. No surprise there, online spaces these days resemble the most deranged comment sections imaginable. This time, though, it wasn't to do with conspiracy cookers or fascists. It was to do with some young people. I myself was young once, and when I was, I noticed certain older people loved being assholes to anyone their junior. These were elders of my current demographic, white, male, middle-aged, and it was common behaviour in workplaces where knowledge about, say, music could be flaunted. It goes without saying that my female colleagues got it much worse than I did. The more I saw this happen, the more I vowed to never do it myself. So when I noticed legacy media having a go at the youths for, say, inventing a new acronym, I tend to instinctively take the youth's side. But there are exceptions. Case in point, as soon as I laid eyes on a TikToker called Kodak Cameron, I felt my blood pressure start to rise. In August, the New York Times published an article about movie talk, a new school of TikTok-based film reviewers who shun the word critic, a word which in this context essentially means film reviewer. The old school was, quote, snobby and untrustworthy. They were fans. The whole thing made my blood boil, mainly because everything they said was factually incorrect and pig ignorant of cultural history. There was swift backlash proclaiming movie talk the death of film criticism, pointing out the corrupt nature of creators accepting sponsorship deals from movie studios and highlighting that what Kodak Cameron is saying in a clip which did the rounds is far snobbier than anything a traditional critic would. In it, he calls Rachel Zegler, who will star in an upcoming Snow White remake, disrespectful for bashing the name of Snow White. She actually just said that the original 86-year-old cartoon is maybe a little old-fashioned and sexist, which it is. He says she's not a true fan because she watched it as a kid and got scared. I'm not making this up. Honestly, it's so dumb, it's not worth dwelling on. Go lick Disney's boots some more, you sniveling twerp. And stop holding that lapel mic in your hand. It clips to your (sighs) T-shirt. One line in the New York Times piece really stuck in my craw a retread of something that's become accepted wisdom about critics, even though it's total horseshit. Quote, They watch movies and are just looking for something to critique. Fans watch movies looking for entertainment. I strongly disagree. People tend to forget. Movie reviewers love movies. That's why they do it. They also tend to love reading reviews. I am constantly consuming criticism, in part because at its best, it can be as legitimate a piece of art as the thing it's critiquing. To throw out a few favourites, I love the writing of Walter Chaw and the oration of Mark Kermode. They couldn't be further apart, but both reveal so much about themselves through their work. I am personally invested in this because I have found myself in the very lucky position of being what you might call a critic. Occasionally I get to review a movie, and a good part of my full-time job involves reviewing music. This is something I've wanted to do since I was a kid. I studied music production and media literacy, but despite having obvious things in my favour, white, male, middle-aged, I didn't think it would actually happen. That's partly because the media is dying, and criticism in particular is under threat. Even the AV Club, which once spawned some of America's best critics, has taken to publishing articles written by ChatGPT. 
public opinion has also turned against critics in the last 20 years or so. And a lot of that is to do with the word. Critics must love to criticise, right? Portrayals in things like Ratatouille and Birdman don't help. There's this idea that film reviewers are hopelessly snobbish and only like the most obscure things. But you only need to look at the response to something like Barbie to see that isn't true. They just like things that are good. And championing things is where critics become essential. Because sure, they might not be raining love down upon The Flash, but they will on After Sun. One of those things will eventually fade from view, and the other will continue to show up in lists of favourites and nurture film fans for generations to come. That's the value of criticism, to provide context. I do understand that being on the receiving end isn't fun. Sometimes I'm called on to host a radio show, and when I do this, the computer in front of me shows in real time what people are texting in. Probably no surprise to learn that some can be very personal and very insulting. Negative feedback can be helpful and constructive, and honestly, 99.9% of what comes in is positive. But it only takes one nasty text to ruin your show, and sometimes your day. So I get that for filmmakers, musicians, artists, and so on, getting critiqued can really suck. But when I see Charlie XCX and Lizzo, two incredibly successful, wealthy, and very well-reviewed artists railing against critics, going so far as to commission t-shirts, it feels a lot like punching down. Like people who live in mansions having a go at someone struggling to pay the rent on their studio apartment because they got a job talking about a medium they love. Lizzo and Charlie saw that one negative comment, and it wrecked them. It should go without saying that having a negative opinion about something popular is allowed. I'd go so far as to say it's a crucial part of the whole cultural shebang. Apply the same metric to, say, politics, and it goes without saying. But a few years ago, in the fever swamp of internet reckons, people started to opine rather gleefully that it wasn't needed anymore. Everyone's a critic now, so no one is, goes their thinking. But I've never seen a single paid critic begrudge anyone doing it online for fun. Quite the opposite, in fact. I am blessed in my day job to only discuss music I like. This neatly keeps me out of the negative critic crosshairs. And as I've discovered, it's very valuable to musicians. The overwhelming response I get is, thank you for listening. Multiple local publications are no longer with us. And while several websites are filling a crucial void... It can feel like an industry run on vibes and streaming figures rather than actual engagement. There should be many more people in my position, ideally people who aren't white, male, and middle-aged. It should be a dialogue, not a monolith of PR and metrics. There's a website or app called Letterboxd, which has risen to prominence in recent years. Started in New Zealand, he said, tearfully saluting the flag, It allows users to rate and critique movies. Tellingly, it's very popular with critics, who, again, tend to welcome as many people joining their sandbox as possible. And these paid critics frequently log the same kind of jokey, brief review as casual fans. I've seen a few people decry this kind of thing as destroying the medium or whatever, but that's horseshit. It's clearly doing the opposite. Much more of a concern is the kind of brain-dead brand adherence displayed by the movie talk people. The way media has blobbed together into a handful of giant companies is one, bad, and two, gross. And it's not hard to see how armies of fans came to log on every day and defend, say, Disney, given that a handful of social media companies are set up to enable exactly that type of behaviour. But it's still troubling. On social media, some critics have been decrying the death of media literacy, and there might be some truth to that. The web has changed our brains. Staying objective is more and more challenging. We can diagnose why this is in the years to come, but a refrain among certain fans is that movies should deliver plot and nothing more. Anything else is pretentious or shock value. Recently, these people decided that sex scenes are unnecessary. This speaks to a real misunderstanding of what art is, in my opinion and it might indicate other, more troubling things.
How's the anger scale today, Tony? Is it safe to talk to you now? I think we're okay. You know, it's been a while since I actually wrote this and I've been working through my feelings every time <laughs> you know, someone's linked it back to me. Have you had much reaction to it or, or do young people not read Webworm? <laughs> I actually don't know the demographic on Webworm, but maybe there are a few things I should say, which is that a good proportion of the readership is American. So I was bearing that in mind when I wrote it. And the other quite crucial thing is that I did not realize that this would be outside a paywall. So I was <laughs> I was very surprised to wake up one morning and discover that it was available to the general public. And now here we are on National Radio <laughs> critiquing it. Oh, the thoughts we let fly when we don't <laughs> think many people will listen to them. Exactly. I might have uh, censored myself slightly had I known. Okay, I'm sorry. I apologise for this. <laughs> then. Um, it's so dumb it's not worth dwelling on, and then we dwell on it quite substantially. But, you know, it had to be said, right? Well, I think so. I mean... I. I guess what I meant is I I didn't want to dwell on that one guy and that one stupid opinion that he had, but that was the the trigger point for the whole thing. You're you're right. I, I think this is it, a damn bursting. That was the, <laughs> it. Was the, the proverbial straw? Um, yeah, I I thought Kodak Cameron's video just spoke to a really troubling trend where there is this allegiance to to companies like Disney you know, over the concern, the legitimate concerns of this very young uh, actor. Um, And that's something that I have noticed more and more. People are fans of huge companies now, and in their eyes, they can do no wrong. And in in my mind, that is the opposite of, you know, what critics should be doing. Yeah, I mean, Disney even has its own cruise ship now, so. It's madness. Don't they have hotels? They may have shut down now, yeah. The sex scenes being unnecessary thing is really interesting. This week I saw something on X, formerly known as Twitter, about, and, and this is pretty out there, someone arguing that fictional sex is coercive because characters don't have agency. Mm-hmm. In other words, they are being forced to have sex by the author mm-hmm. and therefore can't consent. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean... <laughs> Are these people who live inside the internet and don't meet any real people? Are they the same people who film anti-film criticism on TikTok? I do think there's some crossover. I actually saw that exact same uh, tweet. Um, And I've been wondering about this for a while. In fact, my next column in Webworm is going to be about exactly this. There are theories, uh, like I'm assuming these people are young. That's one thing that you should bear in mind. Who knows how they've been raised? There's also the fact that, you know, this most recent generation or maybe the 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 last few generations have just had in, instantaneous access to pornography on the internet in a way that people my age didn't. And I sort of worry that in their minds, that's the place for sex is hardcore pornography right. and it has no business being in legitimate art. But that's obviously ridiculous because sex is a huge part of yeah. of the, the human experience. Well, it's weird too because that those generations have not been having as much sex in real life That's true, as the yeah. ones before them. I did see, I mean, I saw theories about this years ago that, yeah, this access to hardcore pornography was going to create a generation that was... Um, prudish? Prudish, that's it, yeah. Um, and I have seen them dubbed puritines. Oh, my gosh. Wow. (laughs) It's an era I thought we'd never get to. Let's turn the conversation from pornography now, which I wasn't expecting. (laughs) Even the AV Club, you say, which once spawned some of America's best critics, has taken to publishing articles written by ChatGPT. I find that very scary. So years and years ago, the AV Club was bought by one of these huge companies who promised that nothing was going to change. They immediately turned around and fired most of their writers. And then someone just spotted this the other day. I think there was a note down the very bottom of the article sort of saying in coded language that chat GPT had actually written the article by scraping uh, data from IMDb. Wow. But yeah, who would want to read that? Yeah. It's, it's so concerning. Do you think, and interesting you talk about publications that are no longer here, and I'm thinking of the Dear Departed, Rip It Up. Mm-hmm. Do you think there will come a time when we start to turn our back on all this debris and litter that goes on on the web and bring back publications like that? 
I think that's a really optimistic way to look at it. I would love to think that that was true. And I was thinking specifically of Rip It Up when、uh. I read that sentence. Maybe what's more likely is that people will glom on to the better websites. I, I tell you what, maybe it, it seems to be heading towards Substack, honestly, where it is just a writer who doesn't have a job starts a sub, Substack. They are doing the same excellent criticism or writing, and then they ask for. People to pay a subscription fee. I do think that's where some of the best writing is happening. So maybe things will head more in that direction. But I can't see that continuing on for too long before, you know, certain powerful figures shut it down because it's against their best interests. Well, I mean, how many subscriptions do you have? You know, there's some, there is some great writing out there. I'm thinking of Dylan Cleaver with his new Substack and Richard Irvine. But how how much are people willing to pay out、yeah. for individual it, subscriptions? I do see some, like for example, I'm the the AV Club who I mentioned. Some of their film writers have started a Substack called The Reveal, and you know they are great writers. And all they had to do was say, "We are the guys from the AV Club," and people were very willing to pay that subscription. So I think people like them are actually doing okay, and I do think it can be quite financially viable to do that. But you're totally right, and that 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 is a minority of people who would get that privilege. Yeah.、Mm. Do we get to the stage where we just turn off all the noise and carry on doing our own thing, or would it be foolish to ignore these developments? Well, I think much like the Substack thing, I think it is becoming a bit more individualized and a bit less communal.、Um, people fleeing X. Is maybe a good example of that. the The platform has just become so toxic that it has turned off a lot of people. So maybe we will go back to our our private chats, or dare I say it, IRL conversations. Oh, yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> Acronyms. <laughs> I mean, some of them, you know, people like the critical drinker that my kids blast out on a daily basis. It seems a Scottish guy on YouTube. He's got one point eight four million subscribers.、Mm-hmm. Uh, he's anti woke and I think a bit sexist. Seems to hate everything, but、mm-hmm. he's got eyes and ears. I've I've seen clips of this guy. I haven't watched too much, but that is also what I've heard and observed is that he is a bit sexist, and as such, I have no interest in consuming his content. But I can tell you that if you look at the metrics on YouTube for people like that, yeah, it's in the millions. I know people are watching repeatedly, but. The figures are very high, and 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 very high compared to, you know, some legacy media like like Mark Kumod, who I mentioned, for example, he's a BBC critic. You know, he will his videos will get hundreds of thousands of views. They won't get millions. Not pushing the right buttons. I guess so.、Or、yeah, I mean, yeah, it's feeding off that sort of shock value and controversy. I suppose, yeah. <laughs> That was Tony Stamp reading his column. Is film criticism a blessing or a curse? Published on David Farrier's newsletter Webworm. The details long read is supported by the Public Interest Journalism Fund, and we'll be back next week with another long read. Kakitia.